Hello. Yes, a discotheque. All right, so um, please recall Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson is a guy who's been on the scene prior. The War of 1812, he ends the War of 1812 with his Battle of New Orleans. It technically didn't end the war, the battle was over, uh, or the war was over uh, at Ghent, but he certainly becomes a national hero. He's gonna continue his Indian fighting ways. And more than anything, we need to know his origins at, in terms of political power. It's not on here, but you should know that the tariff of 1819, okay, more than anything, which uh, is believed to really have um, uh, endangered the, the stability of farmers out west, and a belief that BOTUS is really to blame for all of the problems that the farmers are facing. That is his currency. He's going to ride that sort of pro-Western, pro-common man all the way to what would appear to be a victory in, in 1824, okay? In 1824, he gets the most votes, but he still ends up in a runoff with Henry Clay, who is really his nemesis, and John Quincy Adams, also somebody that he very much dislikes, whereas Clay and JQA have some similarities, particularly in their support for ideas like the American system. Now, because no one is picked, it goes to the House of Representatives, and it just so happens that Henry Clay is the Speaker of the House. So he wields tremendous power, and there's no real chance that Clay is going to be president. So it comes down to Jackson versus JQA. JQA and, and Henry Clay allegedly strike a deal. It really isn't probably a deal so much as the fact that Henry Clay was the best choice to be Secretary of State. In this particular case, this corrupt bargain gets John Quincy Adams the presidency. But on the day that John Quincy Adams strikes that deal, if there is a deal, he's done, okay? His political obituary, at least as president, is written because John Quincy Adams is the, the wrong guy at the wrong time. He's completely out of touch with the way that the country is going. Andrew Jackson is in touch with the way the country is going. So it's 1824, but by 1828, everybody knows that Andrew Jackson is gonna win. But it's worthwhile to talk about John Quincy Adams because he's an interesting guy and he had interesting ideas that unfortunately for him uh, were out of place. He also happened to be the ugliest president by far. Okay, so <laughs> he pushed for a nationalist program. And if you recall, Henry Clay's American system coming out of the War of 1812 was all about transportation, okay? Uh, that's the T, that you're also gonna have banking, transportation, uh, and, uh, and networks, okay? Sorry, banking tariff and a network of transportation. But he had other ideas, like a national university, a national observatory. Now this is really elevating sort of the academic nature of the United States, but people in the South and people in the West don't care about a university or an observatory. To them, this is certainly uh, the type of privileges that the rich would have, and more than anything, they see this as a threat. Because every time the government starts spending money on federal programs, they worry that it's going to come from somewhere. It's going to have to come from taxes that are collected from a tariff. And the South hates tariffs. So please remember that. More than anything, the South hates tariffs. Because what it does is, it makes it so that American products can be higher priced. It really protects American products. But it doesn't necessarily help American agriculture. The one time that we tried to help American agriculture with a tariff, does anyone know what that tariff was? The one time, it turned out to be quite injurious. The what? Smoot-Hawley tariff, absolutely. The Smoot-Hawley tariff, okay? You had to go way in the future, is the one time that the government tries to help farmers and it backfires so badly that it is a contributor to the Great Depression, okay? So, this is, Pound that chest for an easy answer. All right, so Andrew Jackson is the sort of guy that wants land speculation, that wants to get rid of the Indians. But remember, Andrew Jackson isn't president. John Quincy Adams is. And John Quincy Adams feels like, hey, guys, we need to slow this down, okay? And we need to actually treat the Indians nicely. Sort of almost going back to, say, like uh, Roger Williams uh, saying treat the Indians nicer. And, of course, he was banished to Rhode Island. But all of this together is going to make it so that there's no chance he's going to win. But Andrew Jackson's supporters try a trick, okay? And the trick is that they tried to insert, okay, a tariff. They tried to get John Quincy Adams to have to approve a tariff. And they hoped that this tariff would fail. They, they wanted it to fail so that John Quincy Adams would look bad, okay? 
Oh, that's a good man. He's got the extra copy. Okay. All right. Nice group of kids. It's a wonderful group. I know about six of them. All right, so. <laughs> so, Andrew Jackson's party, now known as the Democrats, again, tries to trap John Quincy Adams with this tariff. John Quincy Adams, being the stubborn man that he is, says, I'm not going to veto this. I'm going to let it go. It's not unconstitutional. I don't like it necessarily, but it's not unconstitutional. So now there's a tariff in place. You've got to understand something. Jackson supporters don't like a tariff, but they wanted it to blow up in John Quincy Adams' face. But then Andrew Jackson is elected in 1828, and what does he have to deal with? Tariff. A tariff that his people tried to get put into play only so that it would explode on their opponent. So it's one of those traps that did not work, and we're going to certainly deal with that when it comes to South Carolina. Okay? So in the election of 1828, another reason Andrew Jackson wins is you're starting to get closer to what we call universal white suffrage. Okay? So it's only going to be men still, obviously, until we get to the 19th Amendment much later, but we're, we're lessening the restrictions. It used to be there were religious restrictions and or property restrictions. So very, very important in terms of increasing suffrage helps the common man. In addition, Andrew Jackson is going to promote the spoil system. The spoil system is this idea that anybody can do a job in the executive office. Now, of course, that helps reward his supporters. It's a way to build loyalty, something that we call patronage, which is going to be undone by Chester A. Arthur. Boy, anyone knows the anti-patronage. This one's harder. Isn't that one thing that he did? It's the one thing that he did. <laughs> it's called the Pendleton Act, okay? You just said that. Oh my God. Say it louder and don't be so sheepish about it. So, by the time, well, it's because your teacher's probably the only one who makes really trivial questions all the time. Every other teacher probably tells a, a relevant story, okay? As opposed to me. So, you've got Jackson in office. There are three parts to Andrew Jackson. Anytime you get Jackson, you've got to come back with Indians, bank, and nullification crisis. Those are the big three. And if you're in my class and you're answering a question about him, I think you'd want to at least address two of those. But what's interesting here about the Native Americans is the southeastern Native Americans, known as the five civilized tribes, did exactly what, quote, the white man wanted. Okay? They created alphabet. They created a constitution. They gave up their, their lifestyle and became farmers. Some even owned slaves. Their reward? Removal. Which is not surprising if you know anything about the white-red narrative going all the way back to, let's say, Jamestown. But the idea that we want to discuss here is the Indian Removal Act, more than anything, was to get Indians out of lands that whites wanted. Andrew Jackson sold it as, I'm trying to help you. We're trying to decrease the tension that we have on the frontier, but it's very hard to look at it as anything other than a land grab by southeastern whites, Andrew Jackson's people. Okay? So we hopefully know about the Trail of Tears, which is going to be um, certainly a time of woe for the Native Americans, but let's discuss sort of what happens between the time that Congress passes this law and most of the tribes actually go. Okay, this is all funky there. There are two cases that you need to know. The first one is Cherokee versus Georgia. The second one is Worcester versus Georgia. They're, they're a little bit funky. Still John Marshall, he of Marbury versus Madison, McCulloch versus Maryland, Dartmouth College versus Woodward, Gibbons versus Ogden, Fletcher versus Peck, and Cohen's versus Virginia. His, his cases. He rules in the first case. You know what? Native Americans, I know you don't want to move. But sorry, guys, it's not our original jurisdiction. We can't actually rule on Native Americans because technically you are what we call dependent people. We're sort of guardians of you, but we can't necessarily rule on your case. So it's a, sorry, we can't do anything about it. So in an effort, actually, to remove Native Americans from Georgia, white missionaries go in and live amongst the Cherokee. And in this particular case, that was outlawed by Georgia. So you're going to have a lawsuit that gets taken to the Supreme Court. In this case, the ruling is the state cannot tell the Cherokee what to do. So this actually is a win for the Cherokee. The first one's sort of like a, sorry, we can't deal with it. The second one is a win for the Cherokee, which you think would be great. The story should end there. The Cherokee gets to stay home. They don't have to leave their ancestral lands and give them up to the whites. But you got a problem. John Marshall's judicial branch can't enforce anything. And the famous line is, 
sort of Marshall has made his decision. Now let's see him back it up. That's what we think Andrew Jackson said. Really what he said is the decision of the Supreme Court has fell stillborn, and they find that they cannot coerce Georgia to yield to its mandate, which is a way of saying, suck it, all right? <laughs> Deal with, with me, I'm Andrew Jackson, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and the Indians are going to move. So in this particular case, what we find here is the Cherokee are some of the last to go. They're herded on this sort of somewhat circuitous trail of tears, and they get given Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Now, having had family that grew up in Oklahoma, I can tell you it is not a desirable place to land. And despite the fact that, again, it was, quote, for their own good, and they could get to have it forever and ever and ever until somebody else wanted it, um, this was not a win by any stretch for the Cherokee, uh, for the Choctaw, for the Chickasaw, for the Creek, even for the Seminoles who were going to hang out a little bit longer, even for the Sock and the Fox. There is a war that is fought in this general area, the first and only military experience for one Abraham Lincoln. Okay? So we've got the Indian rule taken care of. Certainly Jackson wins on that one. And despite the fact that he had an adopted Native American son, I wouldn't say that he was a friend of the Red Man. Okay? Now, the second national bank. The first national bank chartered by our good friend Alexander Hamilton way back in the early days in the 1790s, of course, opposed by Thomas Jefferson. Now, the second bank is not supposed to come up for a recharter until 1836. It was rechartered in 1816 in that sort of era of good feelings, okay? But now the question is, should we recharter early? So Daniel Webster and Henry Clay, opponents of Andrew Jackson, try a trick. Okay, it's all about tricks. They try to recharter the bank four years early. It's 1832. It's not due for four more years. But they say, let's just throw it out there and see how it happens. They believe that if Jackson vetoes it, the Northerners will be aghast because that's their bank. Okay, And if he signs it, all his supporters in the West and South will think, think he sold them out. What is a complete miscalculation is Jackson doesn't need the North. By this point, the West and the South are the political epicenter. The North has really lost its potency. So that miscalculation by Webster, who is a Northerner, and Clay, who's from Kentucky but sees himself more as a Northerner, or at least as a nationalist, uh, they get themselves in trouble. So Jackson says, I'm not going to recharter this bank, because remember, this bank has been injuring Westerners going all the way back to the 18-teens. Particularly, I don't think it's constitutional, which is interesting. Because there's a famous case that says, in fact, BOTUS is constitutional. You remember that case? It's a Marshall case. It's an M versus M case. McCulloch versus Maryland is the deciding, <laughs> definitive decision by SCOTUS that says it's constitutional. But Andrew Jackson doesn't care. Okay, We saw that before. We saw him take on John Marshall with the neighborhoods. He doesn't care. So he says it's not constitutional. Also, I don't believe that this bank has ever been a friend of the Westerners, okay? He says state banks are the friends of Westerners. And lastly, he says, you know what? This is Nicholas Biddle, who's the head of the bank, has always been for the rich. And you know what? There are foreign investors in this bank. So even if the bank does well, foreign investors do well, they're not even Americans. So he's got a number of grievances against the bank. And when given the chance, not surprisingly, he vetoes the bank and over time, by 1836, he has completely killed it altogether, putting his, the federal funds, in wildcat banks, or what we know as pet banks, okay? So, in this 1832 election, just to bring it up for a second, we do have the Anti-Masonic Party, which is one of the early third parties against the Secret Society of the Masons, which Andrew Jackson happened to be a member of. They're the first to give us national conventions and party platforms, which have become uh, very, very commonplace since. Now, after the election, Jackson is going to remove all of the money uh, to his pet banks, which is going to create major problems. Please understand this. In his effort to help the common man out west, he kills BOTUS, which is stability in the financial infrastructure. In creating instability, he hurts the common man. Hopefully you guys understand that. By taking away the only part that is stable and shifting it to pet banks, which willy-nilly loan out all over the place, create over speculation where people can get money and, and buy without necessarily uh, having that capital to begin with, he's going to hurt the common man. So if you're talking about Andrew Jackson and the common man, 
helpful to think that he did something that he thought was protecting them, but at the end of the day, the effect of that is perhaps to injure them more. So we've got two down.